Good morning, Morning Bible Church. Happy Palm Sunday. It's good to be together today. If we haven't met before, my name is Caleb. I want to say hello to everybody hanging out in our courtyard and everybody joining us online as well. Thanks for being with us. Let's stand together, church. We're going to spend some time singing to our God for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's doing here and now. Yes, oh our God 
today, God. I thank you for what you did on the cross. Sunday. 
and it's called I've Witnessed It. And I love the title of this song because it's, it's a word, witness. We don't use this word on a day-to-day, -day, right? It's, witness may feel like an antiquated word to you maybe, or, or maybe you think, you know, pastors only use that word. But Eugene Peterson says this, a witness is never the center, but only the person who points to or names what's going on at the center. As you witness implies presence, it means that we can find God in our own story. His goodness, his faithfulness, his love, his forgiveness, his presence. And in those days, in those weeks, in those months, when it's maybe hard to remember that, we do what the people of God have done for centuries. We sing. We sing to remind our souls of the character of the one who we worship. And, and for those that don't have this hope yet, we get to witness and, and share and s of what we've seen and what we've heard. So as we sing this song, I hope it's a reminder of who we are and who we're called to be. Yeah. 
Jesus, when it's hard to remember, would we lean into your presence? We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Morgan Hill Bible Church. So great to be here on this cool spring morning worshiping with you. My name's Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. Oh, oh, off on. There we go. We're good to go. I'm back. Hey, good morning again. We're just making sure you're all awake this morning. Maybe they're making sure I'm awake this morning. I'm not sure what's going on. All right, there we go. Hey, so uh, if you are newer to Morgan Hill Bible Church and you've never filled out one of our Connect cards, which is in the worship guide you received today, we'd invite you to do so. You can drop that off outside. Some of our pastors will be at the tents outside, or you can drop it off in the offering box in the back. That's just a way for us to stay connected with you and keep you up to date on everything happening here at Morgan Hill Bible Church. Hey, as you likely know, today is often referred to as Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of what often is referred to in the calendar as Holy Week, obviously culminating this weekend in Good Friday on Friday and on Sunday in Easter Sunday. And this Friday actually is our Good Friday service, and it will be a walkthrough of this final week of Jesus' life. Over a third of the Gospels are focused just on this week that Jesus lived, and we'll start with Palm Sunday. Shocker, and you'll get to to experience greater in depth as to what Jesus was living and going through and teaching this final week of his life, culminating obviously in the cross and as he went and died for us. So that's this Friday here from 5.30 to 8 p.m. It's an interactive walkthrough worship experience. It's great for your kids and great for you if you don't have kids or you're young or you're old, whatever stage of life you're in, it will be a, a worshipful experience. And so we encourage you this Friday from 5.30 to eight to be here from any of those times and to walk through. It takes about 15, 20, 25 minutes, depending on how you pace it. Also, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And if you are a part of our church regularly, there's two ways that you can really help us next Sunday. First, this is my easiest self for you is to come to the 815 service. Now I know for you, most of you are here regularly at 815. So you're like, yep, I'll be here next week at 815. Uh, I pray for me at our 11 o'clock service, trying to convince them to come to, come to the earth. I don't know how that will go. They may look at me sideways, like, we have an 815 service? Yeah, yes, we do. Um, we will have, most likely, hundreds of guests here on Easter Sunday, people who only come to church once or twice a year. The large, large majority of those will be coming to our later two services. And so if Morgan Hill Bible Church is your church and you're able to come at 815, that frees up a seat for someone at our later services who really needs to hear the good news about what Jesus has done for them, what Easter is really all about. And so I encourage you to be here. It's the same service. You'll get all of us fresh before we've done it before, so it'll be a great time. Also, if you would, just be praying for our services next Sunday. We fully understand that it's not a sermon, it's not a song that saves people, it's only when the the power of the Holy Spirit moves in our midst as we gather. And so as we gather next Sunday, it really is our hope that people who are just in because it's Easter, that they would be drawn to what Jesus has done for them and that the truth of the cross and the resurrection would powerfully change their lives. And so would you join us even right now in praying for our Easter services and what God is going to do in our midst? God, we thank you even as we sang this morning that we've been witnesses to all that you've done for us. God, and that you, because of the cross and resurrection, have given us life, have given us forgiveness, hope, have given us purpose. God, and we've been so good, we've been witnesses to your goodness in our lives. God, we pray for for the events of this next week. God, we know there will be so many people who will be here next Sunday just because it's the thing to do on Easter. God, we pray that that as they come into this place, and we pray for those who will come to the churches around this area as well. 
God, that your spirit would work powerfully in their hearts and in their lives and they would be drawn to the truth of what Jesus has done for us. We thank you that we do serve a living God and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. I think one of the most difficult tasks we've been given as humans is to finish well. Now for some of us in this room, when we hear that statement, man, I've got drive, I've got tenacity, I can finish. And for other of us in this room, when you say like, we have to finish, you're like, that's a journey. Like that is almost impossible for me to do. But finishing and finishing well are drastically different. And when someone finishes well, we celebrate and we rejoice and get to experience the fruit of them and what they have accomplished. Think about the millions of lives that were impacted by Mother Teresa's faithfulness to love and support thousands of marginalized individuals. Her love and support on those people didn't just impact them, but generations to follow. Now, it's easy for us to, to look at the big names and say, oh yeah, they finished well, look at what they've done. But we can also talk about the boss who's finished well. Or instead of coasting to the end of his career, chose to continue to, to support, to love, to pour into the staff. And when his transition came, everyone else in the company continued to still blossom and flourish. Or that couple who's been married for 60 years and loved Jesus and were faithful to one another and they continued to pour out unto themselves, to their kids, their grandkids, and their great-grandkids. Like when someone finishes well, we rejoice and celebrate. But every one of us knows what happens when someone doesn't finish well, simply finishes. We experience pain, hurt, and we mourn what has taken place. And we can see that in the big names too. Like, Adolf Hitler, who started his career to help reunite a broken nation, but we don't know him for that. <laughs> right, we know him for what he did at the end of his career, the dictation and the evil, horrific things against humanity. But same just as true with those who are big names. We can look, think about the, the boss who did just coast. And then when he left, it was just a bunch of chaos in the company because of, of what happened or that couple that wasn't faithful and the pain that comes of it. You see, finishing well and finishing are vastly different. But finishing well doesn't just happen, right? It doesn't just appear in our lap, it comes with intentionality. So today, as we conclude this series entitled Journey, going through the ups and downs of life, where we've been walking through the story of a man named Jacob and have seen some of the things that have taken place, we are gonna be looking at his final story that's dedicated to him and him alone. Now, his name, Jacob or Israel, you'll see throughout the rest of the Bible because it's identifying the people of God, um, but, and his as a person will appear at one or two more times in the text in the rest of Genesis, but he is no longer the major player. This is his final story. And we're gonna look at what it means to finish well as we look at what he has done here. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Genesis 35. And I feel like I'm a broken record at this point of uh, warning you all about my dyslexia when we read things in the Old Testament uh, because there are some names in here that I'm just struggling with. So just bear with me. Um, but here it says this. It says, God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to God who answers me in the days of my distress, who have been with me wherever I've gone. So they gave to Jacob all their foreign gods and they had in their rings that were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journey, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Cana, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel because the, there God had revealed himself to him who had fled from his brother. 
and Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and she buried under an oak on, below Bethel. So he called its name Alan Beckerth. God appeared to Jacob again and when he came from Perda Aram and blessed him and God said to him, your name is Jacob, but no longer shall you be called name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So God called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I have gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and I will give the land to your offsprings after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, and a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor and she had a hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. And as her soul was departing for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Erith, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillow over her tomb and it is a pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on the pitch and his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And while Israel lived in the land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12, the sons of Leah and Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zephar, Leah's servant, is Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Peta Aram. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Miriam of or Kirith Arbor, which is Haram, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. And now the days of Isaac were 180 years. And Isaac breathed his last, and he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his son Esau and Jacob were buried, buried him. When I was in the sixth grade, I was attending a church youth group service. And I vividly remember sitting on the back of the room on a stack of chairs, because I was too cool to be in front of anyone else. I don't think anyone's ever been that way in their life, thinking they're too cool for school. But I was sitting in the back of, on these chairs and listening to the message and In that moment, I had this overwhelming sense, this just reality that God was calling me to full-time ministry. I didn't, I had this this impression, I remember going back to my parents' house that night and telling them about this, and my parents, I was in sixth grade, like, oh, that's really cool. But I'm sure they, like most parents, when you have a sixth grader, like, what are you gonna tell me tomorrow, though? Right, and so they were excited about it, but in many ways, they just like kind of let it brush off. Well. Over the next course, a couple of months, I had some of major life crises take place. Those experiences caused me to question God, doubt God, and then eventually disbelieve in him. And from that moment in sixth grade until the end of my freshman year of college, I learned to try to navigate two worlds. One was the world that my parents were like, well, you're going to church no matter what. Now, as a side, if you are a parent in this room and and your kids are struggling with faith, I just wanna say as a student, as a child, I hated that my parents did this, but as an adult, I am beyond grateful that they chose to make that the number one priority in my life because seeds don't fall on deaf ears and there were things being planted into my life even though I wasn't always listening. And so they did this and I would pretend and, and kind of fake it, but then the rest of the week, those other two hours out of the, the, the week that I was not in church, I was living my own life and my own journey and, and kind of really forgetting anything to do with Jesus. Well, when I uh, ended up applying for colleges, I ended up getting into school for pre-law because I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. And um, at, on Cesar Chavez Day, 2008, I was walking to my fraternity house and I was literally stopped in my tracks. And in that moment, I heard this audible voice say to me, Ricky, you're done here. Now at the time, I had no idea what that meant. 
But over the next couple of weeks and months, God started to put people into my life to start to affirm and to confirm and call me back to something that he had told me several years beforehand. And in that season of life, I remember thinking to myself, how could God allow someone like me who's done such grievous things to go back to this calling? And last week, if you're with us, Pastor Michael shared that his last point was that no person or no place is too far from redemption. And that is a beautiful truth for those who have been hurt who've experienced hardship or neglect or pain, but that extension of grace and mercy isn't just to those who experience hardship, it's also extended to those who have participated in it. And God was in many ways saying to me that that same grace is extended into you. What are you gonna do? And that's what's happening here in verse one. It says that God appears to Jacob, and if you were here with us last week and you're going like, God appeared to him after what? One of the most gruesome passages of scripture is in Genesis 34 with you know, this rape and then this genocide that takes place. And you're like, God appeared to him still, but no person or no place is too far from redemption. And what God was doing is he was extending something to Jacob. But what Jacob does here matters. I don't want us to think in this room that God's constantly just gonna give grace upon grace and God grace and never gonna have consequences. We see consequences all throughout scripture. And what we can learn from here is this, that finishing well is not living a perfect life, but rather a repentant one. Not is living a repentant one. Jacob's life is marked with highs and lows and and, and moments of unfaithfulness and yet God still appeared to him and says to him, it's time for you to go to Bethel. Now, if you've been following along in this journey, it wouldn't be a surprise to you that Jacob has not been faithful to what he's been called to do. Um, His story is marked with him lying, deceiving, um, not following through, going other directions. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to you that God is telling him to go to Bethel again. But he told him to go to Bethel several chapters before this. And so scholars believe this is anywhere from 10 to 20 years of time that he has not gotten to the place in which God had called him to, and yet God's mercy and grace is extended to him one more time and says, go. And what does he do this time? He does something overwhelmingly beautiful. He says to the people that he was over, give me your idols, and your, the earrings were a part of the ways of worship, and we're gonna go and cleanse ourselves and go on this journey. Now, in the text, we read this location called Shechem. Now, if you're here with us this last week, it should have ringed pretty loud because that's where everything that happened in 34 took place. But what Isaac or Jacob is doing here is he's taking all of the idols and he's going back to the place of pain and burying it. This is an act of repentance. He's going to that place where mistakes and troubles and hurt was taken place and his neglect. And he is bringing the things that they took from there and he's bearing it there as an act of repentance. That doesn't change what took place at Shechem, but he's omitting himself as a, his faults there and saying it's time to move back in towards the direction of God. Now, I think for many of us, when we hear uh, idols in the, in the Bible, we just don't relate because I don't got like a miniature like Buddha is in my house <laughs> or I don't have like other type of, uh, you know, idol, uh, you know God, false gods in my home. But we have to understand that what these were so that we can understand how we can relate. See, many of the idols that we read about in scripture um, were kind of like good luck charms and they more were in your house for what they represented. And the things that they represented were like wealth, fertility, safety, and covering. And I don't know about you guys, but I know that there are many times in my own life that when I look at, I can, in my own life, I can look at and see that there are idols I've had in my life where I have kind of like said, oh man, I'm really needing this. 
and I've gone on trips and been more focused on trying to make sure I'm doing everything right to keep me safe instead of saying, Lord, how are you keeping me safe? Where I have been looking at my finances or my future and going, how, how can I best do this instead of saying, Lord, how can you best help me steward this? See, that's what those things were. And so he was taking those things and bearing them. And what most scholars believe that was happening is that this is something he was supposed to do a long time before that. Because when he was first called to leave his father-in-law's house 10 to 20 years before this, his favorite wife, Rachel, took the household idols and hid them. These charms, these, these things to represent it. And he should have buried them then, but he didn't. And they've been a part of his home for all this time. And so he's taking the things from Shechem, this raid, as well as he's been taking those things that his wife had brought and he's leaving them there. And he's finally making the choice to say, I will start walking toward you. Because one of the things that Jacob had said to God is that if you get me back to my father's country, I will worship you and you alone. Now, repentance is a military term. It means that I am actually literally walking one direction and completely turning around and walking the other way. And it's an act of saying that this no longer defines me, that it's no longer a part of my life, and it's now something I'm moving forward. And that's what's taking place here. He's doing that. And I think what's something so beautiful about when we live a life of repentance, there's two things that we see in this text that come from it. The first one is there is a unseen covering. It says here that as they were walking through this journey that God put a fear of the Lord upon the communities around him so that they would not attack Jacob and his family. We get information in scripture often that the authors or the characters in the story don't. Jacob has no idea what his God is doing on his behalf, but God is fighting battles for him that he didn't know existed. Uh, almost a decade ago, um, my wife and I were pregnant with our uh, first child, her name's Charlie, and it, we were serving in a church in Oklahoma and we started getting pursued by another church to, to, to join their staff. And we started spending this time and going through interviews and it was getting longer and longer and it got to the point where we we're like, hey, it's probably gonna be a decision that we're gonna make, whether to, to attend it or not. And so my wife and I decided to make a journey to their church to, uh, to be a part of a service. We hadn't done that, and we didn't want to make a decision that we didn't have the opportunities to be in the, in the worship experience. So we drive this hour to this church, and we, we pull up, and we have this excitement because, like, man, things seem to be going really well. We get to there, and as we leave the service, there was just this awkward silence that my wife and I had as we were driving back that hour home. And I finally just said, so what did you think? She's like, I don't know. I was saying, are you saying I don't know because you genuinely have no idea or you're afraid of what is on your heart that I will be saddened by what you believe? She says, probably the second one. It's like, are you thinking the same thing that I'm thinking that God is telling us no, that this isn't the place for us? And she's like, yeah. Well, over the next couple of days, we ended up telling the church that we're not gonna be pursuing them anymore. And I remember being so angry with God. Why did we go through all this time, do all these things, I just don't get it. It was like two months after my daughter had been born, I get a phone call from a friend who I had called in that interview process asking if he knew anything about that church. He's like, hey, do you remember that church that you were applying for like nine months ago? I was like, yeah, vividly. <laughs> He's like, just to let you know, everyone on staff was fired today don't know what's happening, but that just took place. I remember in that moment, God was like, this is what I was saving you from. This is what I was saving you from. And I know that you were so angry and frustrated for me, but I was covering you in ways that you didn't know because you didn't need to go through this with a two month year old. And I just remember weeping. See that when I finish one, I start pursuing a life of repentance, God starts to cover me in ways and fights for battles that I didn't know existed. And there's some of us in this room this morning that need to know that God is actually fighting things on your behalf that knows aren't always rejections of you, but oftentimes are God's coverings of you. 
his protection from things unseen. Now, most of us don't get the blessing of knowing how God was fighting our battles, but when we are on his team, it's declared over and over and over and over again in scripture that that is what is happening. He is fighting our battles. The other thing that we see here is something that I think is so beautiful and so powerful is that repentance brings you to your God identity. It says that when Jacob finally gets to Bethel and he gets there and he starts to worship God, it says God appeared to him and said, your name is Jacob, but now I call you Israel. He was giving him a name change. Now, throughout scripture, names are very important. Uh, Because when you spoke a name, you weren't just saying a title, you were actually declaring characteristics. Now, Jacob's name means heel grabber. Now, when he was born, that idea was that he would be able to be close and intimate to God. But what that ended up turning out to be was a deceiver. And so as he starts to journey through life, as people are speaking over him every single day, he's hearing someone call him deceiver. Deceiver. Hey, deceiver. Hey, deceiver, come. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when someone speaks something over me, it's pretty hard not to eventually become what they've been saying. It's interesting, I watched a video this week about um, companies are trying to be more intentional about not saying that people are underachievers but starting to call the beauty in them because when they recognize that the impact of saying someone's an underachiever and the way that they start to become more of an underachiever because what's been speaking over them is actually becoming their identity. And so it's hard to imagine why, it's not hard to imagine why Jacob's life has been marked this way because he's spent time and time and time again being told that he is dece- deceiving that he's, that he's a deceiver by nature. And what God does here and says, that's no longer who you are. Yes, the world might identify to you that way, but I'm now calling you Israel, which is Lord, the, to wrestle with God, which is a blessing. In that day and age, no one thought that they could ever have communication with God. And so the audacity to be known by someone who could wrestle with him was crazy. It was one of the most beautiful gifts that God was doing. Now, for many of us, I think we fully understand what it feels like to be this. Because when we're born, you know, we're given a name. Let's see if this works. Right, and that name is, starts to walk on us. Right, this is my name, it's Ricky. And we start living life and, and with this name, but then circumstances start to take place. And life starts to happen. And hurts start to come and, and we get certain new names getting taped onto us, like no purpose. Or unwanted. Or unsafe. Or unloved. Or inadequate. not secure. We're unsuccessful. And these names start to mark us as we start walking around. And we try our hardest to hide these things, but the reality is that we start to experience that and so we, we, we've learned to, to take things and, and start to try to hide ourselves in it and start to wrap ourselves because these new names are starting to become overwhelming. And so we start to try to hide it. But eventually the lights, the heat, causes us to start to strip, right? You know, we've all heard the term when life hits the fan. These names start to come back out. And so we've allowed this to become our identity because we've had those things spoken over to us. But when we live this repentant life, God, and we start to pursue after God, God says to you, hey, I want this. This is not you. Hey, I, I want this. This is not you. This is what the world has defined you. It's not who you are. I want 
this. Now God has told Jacob time and time again that that's not who he is. And one of the realities that we face is that it takes time for our, I, our worldly identity to be changed by a godly one. See, God has to continue to speak life into us and to be reminded of us. But if I consistently try to take those off, they'll come right back. It's only when I live a repentant life, when I'm choosing to say I'm living a life that represents Jesus and I'm going to the place where he's going, that those other names start to fall and the truth of who I am shines great. Because God has given you a name and he's declared that you are loved and beautiful and cared for and, and all of those realities, those things that you're struggling with, but it's only when I come before him and walk towards where he wants us, where he wants me to be, which is in his presence. El Bethel means God in, uh, God's house. So when I go to God's house, he starts to reveal who I am to him. And which leads us to the second point of what it means to finishing well. Finishing well is not allowing your challenges to define you. Jacob's life has been marked by hardship after hardship after hardship. And it's so easy for us to allow these hardships to define us. And yet we see that finishing well is not the absence of difficulties, but just not being marked by them. In the text, we are told there were three things, three hardships, difficulties that were there. You had the first one, which is that one of his, he had a wife die, his, his concubine die. Then you had his favorite wife die, and then you had his son have sex with his other, his other concubine. Just quick side, because I don't have that much detailed time to get into it. That's just a political movement in that day and age. Like it was a way of saying like, I'm the man in charge. You have no power over me and I am doing this act as a way to demonstrate to everyone else around me. I'm the person in charge. So this man is, got, is getting to the end of his life and he's not coasting through it, right? He's still experiencing these, these grievous hardships. And in the midst of all of this, Jacob has been defined his entire life by the circumstances of his past. We are told that Rachel is naming her son, Ben-Oni, and that name means the child of my sorrows. See, Rachel is allowing her pain, not, that, not to deny her pain, to not just impact her, but to impact the generation after her. Right? This son would have been heard his entire life, you are a person of sorrow, that when you walk in the room, sorrow comes with me. Instead, Jacob, Israel, calls his son ben German, which means my right-hand man, a person who is trustworthy and faithful, it is a radically different name. And the reason why Jacob does that, I believe, is because he just had his name changed. See, when I live a repentant life and I'm seeking to do that, it's a lot easier for me to then experience, not a lot easier for me to allow my past not to define my future. But so many of us have allowed our, our past to define our future. These names define where we go. We think that, oh man, every step I take, I'm just, that's gonna be me. And God says, no, that is not who you are. You can be set free of that. Man, there's families who have been marked generations because of someone's pain or hurt. And you, as an individual, have the ability to stand firm and say, that's not who we will be anymore. That's not who I am anymore because of what Christ has done. So don't allow your past to mark your present. Now, that doesn't neglect the reality that life will look different because of your past and that circumstances are going to look different and life will be shaped different because of it, but you don't have to walk in the bondage of it. God can step in and redeem any situation. Which leads us to the, this last one. It says, finishing well seeks restoration. At the end of this text, we are told that Jacob, Israel at this time, 
appears to his father, Isa. Now, the last time that him and his father have spent time together, it has been 30 years. And the last time he was with his father, he committed identity theft. <laughs> he he depen 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 uh, de pretended to be his, his other son. He stole from his father, he manipulated his father, and then he abandoned his father. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but I don't know how that conversation went. And I think for many of us, we wished that scripture would have put that in there and said, this is how after 30 years and all the baggage that came, this is what took place. But I believe the reason why scripture was so, it did not put those details in there is because restoration is always gonna look different from person to person. And as humans, we would have tried to come up with a formula saying, did you do the Genesis 35 way to seek restoration? Did you do these four-step plans and help that this would come to be? And, and that's just not the reality of life because restoration from one person is gonna look vastly different to another because we are created different. Now, the reason I said seek and not gain is because it's a two-way street. Both parties have to be willing to do it. But as believers, we are called to take steps toward it whether or not someone in return actually does it. Now that does not mean it's gonna go back to the way it once was, but it's recognizing that this is something God has done. Now you might be thinking to yourself, this is pretty crazy. And at some point in this, you're thinking to yourself like, that sounds nearly impossible. I can't finish well, because I don't have any desire to do any of those things. You're right, it is impossible for you to do outside of Christ. You cannot do any one of those things because it's not your natural desire to do so. Your natural desire is not to be humble to say, I made a mistake, and to go back to that mistake and say, I want to try to, to figure this out and try to, to fix what has taken place. It is impossible for us to be able to pull off these names because they've been placed upon us. It's just not possible. See, the only way it takes place is if we seek the one who lived the perfect life, who died on our behalf and was risen again to do it. And so I would just ask you simply this morning is this. Do you know Jesus? Have you made him the Lord of your life? And if you have not, would that be today? I'm gonna invite the, the band up and we're gonna close this morning. And as we're doing so, I would just simply encourage you to ponder, what did it mean to finish well? And how do I know that that finishing takes place only when I seek the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to do it? And to, if today you have not made him the Lord of your life, would you do so? In your space right now, would you just say, I don't, I don't understand this. Maybe you're real, maybe you're not. But I wanna finish well. I wanna be a person who hasn't had to walk with pain and hurts and be marked by this. I wanna be a person who is loved and adored and experienced the fullness of it. Because finishing well comes when we experience the one who's in us. And so will you maybe ponder for a minute as we sing this last song? you stand with us, church. Only one. 
together today, church. Have a great week, and we can't wait to celebrate with you next Sunday on Easter. Take care.
thousand times I fail. A thousand more, you love me back again. As sure as the new sunrise, and mercy waits as a praise. You alone have welcomed. Missing 
Oregon Hill Bible Church. Hey, happy Palm Sunday. It is good to be together today. If we haven't met before, my name is Caleb. I want to say hello to everybody hanging out on our courtyard and everybody joining us online as well. Thanks for being with us. Let's stand together, church. We're going to spend some time singing to our God for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's doing here and now.
singing together on Easter Sunday. And it's called I've Witnessed It. And I love the title of this song because the word witness is not a word we use a lot in our day-to-day, right? It's, uh, witness might sound like an antiquated word to you or maybe you think, oh, only you know pastors uh, use this word. Eugene Peterson says this, a witness is never the center, but only the person who points to or names what's going on at the center. See, witness implies presence. It means we can find God in our own story, his faithfulness, his his goodness, his love, his forgiveness, his presence. 
and in the days and the weeks and the months that it's hard to remember that we do what the people of God have done for centuries. We sing. We sing to remind our souls of the character of the one who we worship. And, and for those that don't have this hope yet, we get to testify of what we've seen, of what we've heard. And so as we sing this, I hope it's a reminder of who we are and who we're called to be as people of God.
we surrender to you, would it be more of you, Jesus, and less of, less of me? God, I thank you that you use each of our stories to, to tell your story. So would we speak more of your faithfulness, more of your goodness, more of your love, your forgiveness? And God, in the moments that we need reminding, would we just lean into your presence? We love you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And go ahead and have a seat. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Morgan Hill Bible Church. So great to have you here this morning. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are new or newer to Morgan Hill Bible Church and you've never filled out one of our Connect cards, which is in the worship guide you received this morning when you arrived on campus, we'd encourage you to do so. It's just our way to keep you up to date on everything happening here at our church. There's a spot there for prayer requests as well. You can leave that in the offering boxes, which are at the exits from the main auditorium here. And there also you can hand it to one of the pastors who will be out in the courtyard after after our service. We would love it if you're able to do that. Well, today is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of what is often called Holy Week, culminating in the events of next weekend being Good Friday. And then, of course, Easter is a week from today. And our Good Friday service is from 5.30 to 8, and it will walk us through the events of this week, starting our first place that we'll go to during that journey is Palm Sunday, and we'll experience what it meant and the events of it and guide us through each of those last days of Jesus's life that he spent here on earth, culminating in Good Friday and the cross. And we encourage you to be there. It's from 5.30 to 8. It's a walkthrough worship experience. It will take you somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how long you want to pace it. It's great for families to do. It's great for anyone to do. It's designed for all ages, and it's going to be a powerful worship experience and time. So we encourage you to set that side of time this Friday evening right here on campus, and we look forward to seeing you. And then, of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and it's not too late to still invite and to bring someone with you next Sunday to church. I do have one specific request, though. If you are a part of Morgan Hill Bible Church, this is your home church, you're here regularly, and if you're free and able to, we would highly, highly encourage you, and it would be of great benefit to us if you would come to the 815 service next week. For some of you, you're like, you have an 815 service? We do. We already had it today. It was great. It was awesome. And here's the thing. There are hundreds of people who come to church once or twice a year, and Easter is one of those days. And almost all of them, if it's been like the last several years, will come to either the middle or our last service. And there is plenty of seats at 815. You can look around right now. There's not plenty of seats today right now at 930, let alone next week when there will be likely at least 100, if not more, guests here on campus. And we want to create all the space we can for people to hear the news about Jesus and the difference he's made in their lives. So you could be a great service to us. It would be a great help to us if you are able. We understand if you're not, but if you're able to be here for an 815 service, that would be a great benefit and free up space for others to hear the good news about what Jesus has done for them. Well, this morning's a special morning. We have our child dedication today. So now we have a few families who are here. So those families feel free to come on up right now as they, as they make their way up onto the platform. One of the, the huge values of our church is kids and families. We, we here at Morgan Hill Bible Church think there is nothing more important than passing on the faith that God has given to us on to that next generation. And of course, there's no magic pill. Nothing that will happen today will convey that faith necessarily will go on. I can't even pray over these kids and make them sleep through the night. Sorry, guys. If I could, if I could, I gladly would. I would pray for my own kid first, but I would pray for your second. But, but this is just each of these parents not only dedicating their kids to the Lord, but, but saying that they want their homes to be the primary place of discipleship, where that faith takes root and grows in the hearts and the lives of these kids. So parents, I'm just going to ask you to briefly introduce, just one from each, introduce your family to us. Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Ricky, my wife Rachel. This is Charlie and Ava and Lily. Hi, I'm Tori Stefani, and this is Justin, and our older daughter, Lori Kay, and today we're dedicating Ellie. I'm Julie, this is my daughter, Vivian, my husband, Charlie, and today we are dedicating Isaac. 
Awesome. You can just set it right behind you on the peanut. Thank you. Why, well, parents, I heard it said many years ago. Here, I'll hold on to it. That way it doesn't fall on you. You got it? You got it? All right, it's good. It's good. You got it? All right. All right. I heard it said many years ago, um, the, most, the greatest impact you may ever make for the kingdom of God is not something you do, but someone you raise. And that's hard to keep in perspective day in and day out with the most thankless job of parenting, especially for all of you are in that stage with little ones. They very rarely, if ever, say thank you for all those selfless acts of kindness and mercy. But just make your houses, and today you're committing that your house would be that first place of grace where Jesus' love is seen through you and through your lives, and your kids will see that in you consistently lived day in and day out. We're gonna dedicate each of these kids today, um, and each of these parents has actually picked a verse this morning that they want prayed over each of their children. So would you join me in praying for these kids and these families this morning? God, we thank you for little Lily. God, what a gift, what a gift she is from you. God, we thank you for this verse that our parents have picked, God, from Isaiah chapter nine, that those who've walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in a land of darkness, on them light has shined. God, would Lily be someone who shines your light, the light of Jesus in this dark world? Would she be, as Jesus said, a city on a hill, that she would witness to your love, to your grace, and to your mercy? So God, we commit her to you this day, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And God, we thank you for, for little Ellie. God, we thank you for the blessing she is to this family. God, we pray as her parents have picked from Romans 15 that the God of hope would fill her with all joy and peace so that in believing by the power of the Spirit, she may abound in hope. God, we pray that she would know you and that the hope of her life would be evidenced and seen in, in every interaction she has. God, would you be with her parents as they seek to raise her in such a way? We commit Ellie to you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God, we thank you for, for Isaac. God, what a blessing he is to this family. God, we pray for those, these parents and caregivers gathered this morning, this prayer from Colossians 1. And we pray that Isaac would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that he would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, bearing every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May that be true in his life. God, may he know you and may he give witness and grow in his knowledge and love for you all the days of his life. We commit Isaac to you this day, we pray. God, we thank you for the work that you're doing in this church. God, we thank you for, for the testimony of these parents here. God, would you guide them? Would you protect them? Would you lead them in the way that you would have as they seek for all of their kids to know and to follow you all the days of their life? We commit these kids and we commit these families to you and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. I think one of the most difficult tasks in life is finishing well. Now, some of us in this room have great grit and tenacity, and so we're like, ah, that's not that hard. And other of us in this room are like, yes, 100%, finishing well is so beyond difficult. But finishing and finishing well is vastly different. And when someone finishes well, we can experience the fruit of their work, and we can be blessed by what they have accomplished. Think about the millions of lives that were impacted by Mother Teresa's faithfulness to love on thousands of marginalized. See, her desire to pursue Christ and to represent him well on this earth impacted thousands, but those then impacted others. But it's not just the big and famous people that we can think about who finished well. Think about the, the boss who chose, instead of coasting to the end of his career, chose to continue to pour into and to develop and grow the generation behind him or her and the impact that it had on the company when they transitioned away and everything was still stable. Or the 
couple who's been married for 60 years and they have chosen to, to form their lives around God and, and the impact that they had on their children, their grandchildren, and maybe even their great-grandchildren. See, when someone finishes well, we rejoice in what they've accomplished. But for others, we know the hurt and the pain and the sorrow that comes for someone who finishes. Think about people like Adolf Hitler who started with a desire to reunite a broken country and what, he was, what he's known for today. The horrendous, acts against humanity that took place. But it's not just those big names either that we can think about. The boss that did coast to the end of their career and did not pour into the next generation. And when they left, it was like, well, I don't care, I'm done. And so the company can figure it out and the chaos and the pain and the, the disruption that it brought or the impact of an unfaithful couple to one another. Those cause us to mourn and to experience pain and hurt. Finishing well doesn't just come though. It doesn't just happen, stands and fall on our lap. It's something that takes dedication and work and knowing a target to achieve. And so today, as we conclude this series entitled Journey, where over the last few months, we've been looking at this life of Jacob and the journey of highs and lows that he's had. And we're today going to be looking at his last story. Now, the name Jacob in Israel will be seen throughout the rest of the Bible. It's oftentimes representing the people of God. His name, specifically as the person, will appear a few other times in the text, but he is no longer the main character after this. This is his last story. And so we're gonna look at it today and try to figure out what does it mean to finish well. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Genesis 35. Genesis 35. Um, I feel like I'm a broken record at this point. For those who know me, I have dyslexia, and anytime we read anything in the Old Testament, I'm just apologizing in advance because there's some names in here I'm just trying to get through, so bear with me nevertheless. Uh, but we've got some text to read, so here it says this in verse one. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourself and change your garments. Then let us go to Bethel so that I may make an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terabith tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Cana, and he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar of God and called the place El Bethel because God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under the oak below Bethel, so he called his name Erith, sure, <laughs> Alon Bukerth. Uh, God appeared to Jacob again, and when he came from Pada Aram and blessed him, and God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be, uh, your name should be called Jacob, but Israel, shall be your name. So he called it his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give you the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place in where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. And so Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from Ether. Uh, Rachel went into labor and she had a hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. And as her soul was departing for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni. 
But his father called his name Benjamin. So Rachel died and she was buried on the way to Erith, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb and in the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day, Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. While Israel lived in the land of land, Reuben went and lay with, his, with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of this. Now the sons of Jacob were 12, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob, who were born with him in Pada Aram. And Jacob said to his father Isaac at Mirmer, or Kiriath Arbor, which is Haram, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and he gathered to his people, old and full of days. His, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Um, when I was in the sixth grade, I vividly remember sitting in a youth ministry service on a stack of chairs in the back of the room because I thought I was so cool. None of you have ever done that when you were in the sixth grade, right? <clears throat> but I was sitting in this service and I uh, remember not knowing what the, remember vividly what the pastor was speaking, but there was this overwhelming sense in that service that God was calling me into full-time ministry. I remember going home that evening and going and telling my parents that, oh, I think I'm gonna be a, be a pastor and they like great parents. Like, oh, that's so exciting. But probably had this like, but what are you gonna tell us tomorrow moment? You know, like, cause I'm sure you're gonna be an astronaut tomorrow cause I was still young and in sixth grade. But um, a couple of months started to go by and had two major life crises take place. And in those crises, they caused me to doubt God, disbelieve, and then eventually disbelieve that there was a God. And from that moment until I was a freshman year of college, I learned to navigate two worlds. One was the world that my parents forced me to continue to be in, um, which was church. Now, as a quick aside, as a student, I hated that so much because I didn't wanna be there, but as an adult, I'm beyond grateful that my parents did not listen to my will and continued to make church the number one thing in my life because those seeds were being spoken into my life and they came to fruition a long time earlier. And so if you're a parent in this room and your kid is struggling, don't give up on them and continue to be their parent and not their friend and continue to get them to be in service because they will be impacted. But when I was a uh, freshman in college, I pursued a, a degree in law because that's what I thought I was gonna do. I was gonna be a law student. But on Senior Chavez Day, 2008, I was walking to my fraternity house and I was stopped in my tracks. And I heard an audible voice say, Ricky, you're done here. At the time, I had no idea what that was. I thought someone was playing a trick on me or that some of the things that I'd done the night before was just messing with my mind. But over the course of the next few months, God was starting to put people into my life and they were reminding me and pointing me back to his word that God had once called me to a place, to a place of ministry and that he was calling me again. And I remember at the time being overwhelmed with why would God allow me who's done all this evil in this time frame, to still do it? But God was gently through the love and mercy of people reminding me that God's extension of grace is for all. Last week, Pastor Michael's last message was no place or no person is too far from redemption. And that is true for those of us who have experienced the hardship and we can celebrate when God does that. But it's also true for those who have been the participant in the pain. God's mercy is for all. But what takes place, what we do when God's mercy is extended is ma matters. Because God's mercy eventually will say, okay, well, you're gonna reap your consequences. We see that in scripture. There are times when God goes, come on, just come back to me, come back to me. And the people of Israel do. And there's other times they don't and they experience punishment. It's when God is stirring upon your heart, what do you do? And this is the first mark of what it means to finish well. Finishing well is living a repentant life, not a perfect one. 
so many of us believe that when it comes to the way we live, that it's about being perfect. But there's no one who can be perfect. We all make mistakes, we all make shortcomings, we all make failures. And we need to be marked not by a perfect life, but one of humility that says, I have made mistakes and I'm going to own my mistakes. As we read this text, you should have noticed a place called Shechem that was in there. That was one of the first things that we read. And if you're here with us last week, you should know exactly what that place was. That place represented a rape and genocide. And that is a heavy and hard passage. It's one of the most gruesome passages in scripture. And it says that after God appears to him to go to Bethel, that Jacob goes to this community who were participants in this gross, grotesque thing and says, let's take our idols, which are the earrings and these, these little trinkets and go back to this place and he buries them near Shechem. What Jacob was doing here was repenting. Now that didn't change what took place, but he was admitting his fault and doing what he could to bury it. Now, for many of us, I think that when it comes to the concept of idols, especially in the Old Testament, we have no idea what that means. We don't feel like we can relate because let's be honest, none of us carry little like Buddhas in our home, right? We're just like, I don't have that or any other gods in our lives. But we have to remember what those represented. Just because we don't have deified names for gods doesn't mean those gods are still not true to our life. See, the gods that were most likely in their house, because these are gods that were represented there, was the God of fertility, worshiping of children, the God of finances, the God of covering and protection, entertainment. I don't know about you guys, but those things have been in my house. And there have been times where I've pursued those things more than God. And I've allowed those little trinkets to be carrying with me on this journey and saying, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll pursue this God thing, but I really want money. Or maybe I'll pursue this Jesus thing, but I, no, I really want to be safe. So how can I make myself the most safe possible? So what Jacob was doing was something that he should have done, hun- or not hundreds, uh, uh, many chapters before this, which was represent somewhere between, uh, most scholars would say 10 to 15 years before this, when God called him to get to Bethel, that he was supposed to get rid of those things in his life, but he hadn't. And yet God is generous and kind and calls him once again to it. And this time he goes and says, okay, I'm going to serve God. See, finishing well is not a perfect life. It is a repentant one. It's looking at the things that are in my life and saying, God, I've failed to follow you, to get to where you've called me to be. I'm placing that behind and I'm moving in a new direction. Because the word repentance is a military term that meant like you were once having an allegiance to this, but now you're returning your back to, to that and making an allegiance over here. And so finishing well is recognizing that. Now it shouldn't be a surprise to us that Jacob isn't gone to Bethel yet. He is like in this story, he is been deceitful, he's fallen short, he said he's gonna go one way, he's gone the other. Like, this is a man who's marked by lies and deception, and yet, once again, God's mercy was extended upon him. And so many of us need to know that today, that we have, we're not too far from God's extension and his mercy. That he, just like he was to Jacob, is calling upon you to say, will you repent? and get to where I've called you to be. Now, one of the most beautiful things about repentance is the text tells us two things that come with it. The first one, that there is an unseen covering. One of the things that we see in scripture often is that the, the Bible will start to tell us events that were happening that the, the characters in the story had no idea. They didn't know about it. And here we are told that as Jacob is going, is walking towards Bethel, the place where he was always meant to be, that God puts a fear upon the towns around him so that they would not come attack him in the process. That he was protecting them from battles he didn't know existed so that he could get to the place he was called to be. 
when uh, my wife and I were uh, serving in ministry in Oklahoma about a decade ago, um, we were, I think, six, Rachel, not me, <laughs> she was about six, seven months pregnant with our daughter, Charlie, our oldest. And around that time, I was pursued by a church to come fill a position in there. And we started going through this interview process and things were going really good. And it just felt like God was placing us on this fast track into this new role. And about three months into this, we ended up going, feeling pretty, the pretty feeling that it was pretty important for us to go and actually to that church and be a part of the service and experience it. And so we drove the hour to the church, sat in the service, and we got back in the car and started to drive home. It was really awkward, just this awkward silence. I finally said to my wife, so what's going on? Like, what did you think? She's like, I don't know. And I asked her, is, is, are you saying you don't know because you genuinely don't know, or is it because you're afraid of what you think you've heard and you just don't wanna say it? She's like, it's the second one. I'm pretty sure God is telling, it was placing on my heart. This is not the place to go. I was like, yeah, me too. And I was so angry with God, so angry, because everything on this, I'm like, why would you make us go all this effort, do all this time? And it just felt so right, and just for us to say that this isn't it. And over the next course of a few days, God was saying, not only is this not the place that you're gonna, not supposed to be there, but you have to pull your name out of the hat, because they will continue to pursue you. And I was like, I don't wanna do that. But eventually I did. I think it was like six months after Charlie was born, I get a phone call from a friend who lived in that community and was like, hey, you remember that church that you asked me questions about as you were going through that interview process? I was like, yeah, yeah, very vividly. Still kind of struggling with it. He goes, they just fired everyone on staff. The entire staff was gone. I don't know why or what, I just, that's what happened today. I remember in that moment, God was saying to you, this is why I said no. I was protecting your young family from experiencing a hardship that they would not be ready for because you were a young family who needed covering in this season. Now, in that moment, I got to experience the blessing of seeing God's covering, but there are many times in our lives when we do not get to see God's covering over us. And I want you to know that no's aren't always denials of you or your character, but many times can be God's protection over you. That God could be protecting you from something that you did not see because you've been faithful to repent and walk his journey. And when you do that, scripture says he covers you and, and battles for you in ways you didn't know was imaginable. And so when we live a repentant life, we get to experience the covering of God and the protection of God in the journey that he's called us toward. The second thing that we get to see here is that a repentant life leads you to a God-given identity instead of the world's one. It says that when Jacob gets to Bethel and does all the sacrifices and, and worships God, that God comes to him and says, your name is no longer Jacob, but it is Israel. Now in scripture, we don't know the weight of a name because we don't live in a world where our names are characteristics, right? A name is a title in our world. But in scripture, they were declaring a character over you. Now Jacob's name meant heel grabber. Now, there was two ways that that could have played out in his life. The first way was that it meant that he could have clanged so closely to God that people would have seen God more than him. The other reality of that name is deception. It's deceiver. That he could start to manipulate, to trick, to finagle people in their walk, in their lives to get his own thing. Well, as Jacob's story is being unfolded, we are told which name he is. He's the deceiver. And his story is marked by deception. Now, we can't give him full, full some of the credit has gotta be to the reality of what's being spoken over him. Imagine what it'd be like for every day for someone to look at you and say, you're a deceiver. You are a deceiver. You are a deceiver. You are a deceiver. You know what's gonna happen to your life. You're gonna live in the name. You're gonna start to deceive because that's all you've been marked by. 
And so because you've always had that marking on you, then you're always going to live that out. And what God does to here is give him one of the greatest gifts he could. Not only does he fulfill the covenant promise with him, which gets Jacob back to where he's supposed to be, which all the names that were presented was representing that God would give him a great nation and a bunch of names. All those things were there and an amazing blessing, but I would argue that one of the greatest ones he gave was a new name, which meant to wrestle with God. And the reason why that name was so powerful is because in that day and age, no one had access to God. So to, to think that you had the audacity to be someone who could wrestle with him was crazy. But God declares him as a person to wrestle with him. God gave him a new name. You know, the reality is many of us, when, when we were all born with a name. All right, here's mine. Stay. And we start walking through life with our name. And we start building up our resumes and the things that have come with our name. And, and there's some beautiful things that take place, but over time, we also have some new things that come up. Maybe like inadequate. Maybe you have heard that name. Or unsafe. Or unloved. Or not secure. or unsuccessful, or unwanted, or have no purpose. And one of these names starts to define you and goes over top of you. And you've started to live this, li this life with the, a new name placed upon you. And there are times when you're good at hiding it you might start covering yourself and start to, to pretend that it doesn't exist and it's not there, but as the heat of the lights, the pressure of the world, it happens to come back out. And you live a life marked this way. And when you live a repentant life, one of the things that God says to you is, that name is not the name I gave you. That name is not the thing that defines you. And even though the world has said to me, I am unwanted. You're not unwanted to me. And he says to Jacob, your name is no longer deceiver. Your name is to wrestle with God. And he said to me, Ricky, you're no longer unwanted because you're wanted by me. So I don't know what name and which one of those things has marked you this morning. But when you live a life of repentance, the name that, that has hidden your name has been removed. And that God no longer, that the world might say that you are something, but God says you're not. You are my son and my daughter, and this is the name in which you are marked by. So walk in the marking of my name. Which leads us to the, the second point that finishing well is not allowing the, the challenges to define you. So many of us live a life that says that what has happened is what makes me who I am and I will always be that. But finishing well is not the absence of challenges. So many of us assume that finishing well is coasting to the end but it just doesn't happen. Challenges still arise, hardship will still come. Finishing well is not the absence of challenges, it's rather just not being defined by them. In this journey to Bethel, three major events take place. Number one, he has his concubine pass away. A concubine is a half-wife. If you really wanna know the details of it, you can talk to me after. But simply, it's someone that he had intimacy with, someone he had done life with, and that person has died. Not too much longer after that, his favorite wife, the wife that he chose to serve for 14 years to get, she dies. And then, not too long after that, 
his oldest son sleeps with his other wife, his half-wife. Now that's really hard for us to understand and I can once again talk to you more about it in detail, but never, what this is, it is a power move. In that culture, there was a head leader and a father was supposed to say who would be the next head leader. And because Jacob has not done it, Reuben was telling the community around him, I'm the leader, my dad can't control me and here's the proof. And so this is what's taking place. Any one of those things would have been difficult. All three of those is devastating. And Jacob has been known by someone who is allowing those things to define him. And yet we see something radically different here. It says that when Rachel was giving birth in her sorrow and her suffering and her pain, she names her son Ben-Oni, which literally means the, ben of, the, the son of my sorrows. So that kid would have been marked for his entire life as someone who brings sorrow. You are the sorrowful one. You are the one that makes life painful. But Jacob instead names his son Benjamin, which is the son of my right hand. Someone who is trustworthy, honorable, and of great importance. For the very first time, Jacob did not let his past to define his future, but rather allowed Christ, God, Yahweh here, to do it. I heard a pastor say recently that it just hit me so hard was this. Resumes tell you where you've been, but only God will tell you where you're going. And so for the very first time, Jacob doesn't allow his problems to define him, he allows God to. And when we finish well, it's we are doing it because we are saying, God, where are you in this? Now these events, yes, they took place and, and yes, they are gonna shape the, my reality of my life a little different, but that is not the marker for me. You and you alone are the one who will mark me and define me and move me to my future. So how do I look for your future and not the one that I have been told I would have? Rachel was about to allow not her suffering to define not just her, but multiple generations to come. And there are many of us in this room that need to know that when we aren't willing to fight against the definitions of our past and our pain, we won't just mark ourselves, but generations to follow. You can stop the pain and saying it ends with me that I'm gonna be a person, my family's gonna be a person, we are gonna be marked not by what is done, but what God will do. Because seeking, finishing well is not being defined by what has happened. And lastly, we can see this, is that finishing well seeks restoration. At the end of this, Jacob, uh, Israel uh, goes to his father Esau, Esau and we don't understand the, the gravity of time that's taking place in this, but it's been 30 years. And the last time he saw his father, he committed identity theft. He lied to his father about who he was. He stole from his father, he manipulated his father and then abandoned his father. And they haven't spoken in 40 years. I cannot imagine how that conversation went when he showed up back to where his father was. Here I am. And many of us, I think, would go like, gosh, like I wish they would have given us the details of how that took place. But I think the reason why it's not in there is because we are people who love formulas. And we would say like, oh, like when we're seeking restoration, be like, did you do the Genesis 35 way? Would you, did you do the five steps of Israel to make sure you got back into reconciliation with his, with his father? And we would allow that to be more important than recognizing that every person is unique and restoration is different from one to another. The way that I try to make res restoration from one is vastly different than the other. And so what I have to learn is to depend upon God to do it. Now I said seek, not gain, because restoration is a two-way street. 
You cannot influence or demand or force someone to do something. All you can do is focus on your actions and your desire is to do those things. That doesn't always mean that the relationship will go back to the way it once was and there are many times it shouldn't, but it's just not holding a grudge. Now you might be listening to all this and be like, that sounds nearly impossible and you're right. It is impossible. Every single one of those things is not obtainable by your strength. None of us want to humble ourselves to go back to places of hurt and try to make restoration or to, to admit fault. None of us can take those names off ourselves. It is impossible without Christ. It's only him and him alone that you are able to be able to finish well. And so as the band comes up, and as we start to conclude, I would ask for this. Are you in a loving and vital relationship with Jesus? Have you allowed your life to be marked by him and not something else? And if you have not done that today, would this be the day in which you say, Jesus, I don't know how this is gonna work. I might still have doubts of faith, but I want to be a person who's known by you, who experiences your love, your leadership, and your covering. So will you define me? Would you get me to where you need to be? Would you restore me? Would you help me to help those around me? And if that's you today, I would just encourage you to take a moment as we sing this last song, just to have a conversation with a, in your head I'm just saying, Lord, I, I, if you are truly God, I give this all to you. And I ask you that you would help me to mark my life this way. Maybe for those of us in this room that you've been on this journey, but God has called you a place that you haven't got to. That you are supposed to get to Bethel, but you haven't been there yet. Would you take this time to repent and be reconciled to the God who loves you? Because his mercy has been extended upon you. We're concluding with a song called um, the Spirit of the Living God. I totally dropped it. Um, but the reason for that is because it's only God's Spirit who is alive and well that allows us to finish well. So listen to these words as we conclude. Why don't you stand with us, church?
so good to be together today, church. We can't wait to celebrate Easter with you next Sunday. Have a great week, and we'll see you then.
in the soil of my soul and like a garden and like a garden I will
Morgan Hill Bible Church. Hey, happy Palm Sunday. It is good to be together today. If we haven't met before, my name is Caleb. I want to say hello to everybody hanging out on our courtyard and everybody joining us online. Thanks for being with us. Let's stand together, church. We're going to spend some time singing through our God for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's doing here and now. I hate 
Sunday it's called I've Witnessed It. I love the title of this song because witness is not really a word that we use on our day to day, right? Witness might even sound like an antiquated word to some of us or maybe you think, you know, only pastors use that word. Eugene Peterson says this, a witness is never the center, but only the person who points to or names what's going on at the center. So witness implies presence. It means we can find God in our own story, his goodness, his faithfulness, his love, his forgiveness, his presence. 
and in the days and the weeks in the months when it's hard to remember that we do what the people of God have done for centuries we sing we sing to remind our souls of the character of the one who we worship and and for those that don't have this hope yet we get to testify of what we've seen and what we've heard so as we sing this together I hope it reminds us of who we are and the people that God has called us to be
Jesus, we pour out our praise to you. We surrender to you more of you, God, less of me. Lord, I thank you that you use our stories to help tell your story. So would we speak more of your faithfulness, more of your goodness, more of your love, more of your forgiveness to those around us, to our families, to the ones we see each and every day. And God, in those moments when we need reminding, would we lean into your presence, knowing that you're with us. We pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And go ahead. Have a seat. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Morgan Hill Bible Church. So great to have you here this morning worshiping with us. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so uh, We're so glad that you're here on what turned out to be a sunny so far morning. It was raining at the first service this morning, but now it's sunny, so it's great to have you here. Uh, if you are new or newer to Morgan Hill Bible Church and you've not yet filled out one of our Connect cards, I'd encourage you to do so. That's in the worship guide you received this morning. That's our way just to keep you up to date on all the information and everything that is happening here at our church. Hey, today, as you likely know, is what's often referred to as Palm Sunday, which is the beginning of what we celebrate being the last week of Jesus's life, culminating in the events of Good Friday this next weekend, and then ultimately Easter Sunday, which is a week from today. And I want to invite you to two things that are coming up next week. And first, our Good Friday service, which is from 5.30 to 8. And it will walk through this last week of Jesus' life. So the first station will focus on Palm Sunday and the events that happened on that day. And then on to Monday and the rest of that week, which is so important in the Gospels, obviously culminating on the, the crucifixion on Good Friday. It's a walk-through worship experience. It will take you anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how fast or how slow you want to move through it at your own pace. It's great for kids. It's great even if you don't have kids. We'd encourage you to be there 5.30 to 8 this Friday night for a Good Friday service. And then next Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday. And there is a very particular way, if you are a regular part of Morgan Hill Bible Church, that you could be of service to us next week. And that is this. If you could come to our 815 service. I know, that's a hard sell for this crowd. You're like, 815? You have church at that time of day? We do. We actually did today, and it was great. It's the same thing you'll see here at 11. Now, here's the thing. On Easter Sunday, um, there typically, if this year is like the last several years, there will be hundreds of people who will come here to Morgan Hill Bible Church and to many other churches around this area who come once or twice a year. And as you look around this auditorium right now, we don't have room for hundreds more people in our normal later two services we do at our normal earliest service. And so most people will come to either the middle or our later service. And so if Morgan Hill Bible Church is your church, I just want to strongly encourage you, if you are able, if not, Come to the middle or the later one. We won't judge you at all for it. But if you are able to come to our 815 service, that will open up a seat for someone who once or twice a year maybe comes to church to make them be able to have a seat to hear the gospel preached. And so if you're able to help us in that way, we would greatly appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday and celebrating Easter with you. Well, this morning is a special Sunday because it is a child dedication Sunday. And so the families, I think there's three families for the service who are have, having kids dedicated this morning. Feel free to come on up to the stage. Come on up to the stage. We, are we clapping? We're kind of clapping. Are we clapping? Yeah, 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 all right, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> We at, we at Morgan Hill Bible Church believe that, that there's nothing more important than passing on our faith to the next generation, and that that is so crucial and so vital in the role that churches have, but also the role that parents have as a part of this. And there's nothing magical that happens today. There's no silver bullet to faith because your kid will be prayed for. It doesn't guarantee anything. I can't even guarantee they'll sleep through the night tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> If I could do that, I would pray for my own kids first and then pray for yours secondly. But a large part of this dedication is, is not just a dedication of your children, but it's a dedication of, of you. Recognizing that as a church, we want to do all we can to support you, but the primary place of discipleship is in your homes. And your kids will see your faith far more than they will see the faith of anyone here at this church. And so as we, as we dedicate your kids this morning, would you just go ahead and introduce your families to us? Uh, we're the Proices. Uh, my name is Zach. This is Nicole, and this is uh, three-month-old Nayla, our daughter. Hi, we're the Kawaharas. I'm Josh. 
This is my wife, Lauren. This is Levi and Lily. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I'm, uh, I'm often in moments like this reminded of, of a statement I heard many years ago. It says, the greatest thing you may ever do for the kingdom of God is not something you do, but someone you raise. That often our kids are the greatest legacy, the greatest impact we will ever make in this world of anything we do. And it's often challenging because it's the most thankless thing you'll ever do as well, especially in this stage of life. Right? They don't say, thank you for getting up, for feeding me, for cleaning my clothes, for taking me places, but it's the, the small day-in, day-out investments that you make in the life of your kids that will matter and make an eternal difference. And so I just want to encourage you to continue to, to pray for and to model that faith in your homes that you hope to see in your kids one day as they grow throughout these years and enter into adulthood, hopefully to follow after Jesus as well. Each of these families has picked a verse that they would like to be prayed over their kids. And so would you join me as we pray for and dedicate these kids to the Lord this morning? God, we thank you for little, is it Nayla? For, Na for Nayla. God, what a beautiful little girl she is. God, we dedicate her to you this morning. God, we pray Deuteronomy 31, 6 over her, that she would be strong and courageous, that she would not live in fear, that God would be her God, that he would never leave her or forsake her. God, would that be true? Would she be a strong and courageous person for you? Would she live for you and represent you to this world? Would we commit her and her family to you today? We pray this in Jesus' name. And God, we thank you for these two little ones, for Lily and for Levi. God, we pray number six over them. God, would you bless them? Would you keep them? God, would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them? Would you lift up your countenance upon them and would you give them peace? God, we pray that these two little ones would live in your presence, that they would see your face and seek to follow you all the days of their life. And so we dedicate them to you this morning and we pray this in your name. And God, we thank you just for the opportunity to be here, to pray along and support these families. God, we thank you for the things that you're doing in our church. God, and we look forward with anticipation to still what you're going to do. And we ask that you would continue to bless this time as we gather this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most difficult tasks in life is finishing well. Now, some of us in this room, when we hear those words, we're like, I've got grit, I got tenacity, finishing isn't that difficult. Now, there's others in this room where you hear that statement and you're like, uh, yes, I fully understand what it means and how hard it is to finish something. But finishing well and finishing are vastly different. And we understand what that looks like and we can experience the, the beautiful gifts of finishing well and the pain for those who just simply finish. And think about the impact that Mother Teresa had on not just the thousand of marginalized that she poured into, but the millions of individuals that were impacted because of her faithfulness to continue to strive to be faithful to what God had called her and love well and that love transcended beyond all that she was doing. Now, it's not in just those big names that we can go, wow, yeah, they finished well. It's also in the boss who, instead of coasting through line, the finish line, like he's going to retire, chose to continue to pour into, invest, and develop the generation and the leaders behind him so that when his time came to an end, there was a beautiful and smooth transition. Or we have that family who's been, that couple who's been together for 60 years and they've poured into their love and beauty and, and through that time, they got to bless not only themselves, but their kids, their grandkids, and even their great-grandchildren. See, those individuals that, that finish well, we get to celebrate, we get to experience the fruit of that labor. But we all know the hurt and the pain. We've probably had to mourn and deal with the problems that come when someone just finishes. Like on the grand scale, like Adolf Hitler, who's someone who originally went into politics to help bring a broken nation back to, 
together is now known for someone for the horrific genocide he created. Or the boss who started coasting to the end and allowed the business to just to figure it out on its own and the chaos that came because he left and didn't do a good job at supporting and developing and bringing up people behind him. We know the hurt that comes when a couple has not been faithful to one another and the impact it has on those around us. You see, finishing and finishing well are different. But finishing well is something that doesn't just happen to us. It doesn't just fall upon our lap. It's something that comes from dedication and and being marked by things to do. And so today, as we conclude our series called Journey, going through the ups and downs of life, where we've spent the last few months looking at the story of Jacob, we're gonna look at what does it mean to finish well. Now, just for some clarity, Jacob, the person will still be in some of the other stories in Genesis, but he no longer is the focal point. This is the last one of him. But the name Jacob and name Israel will be throughout the, both the Old and New Testament because it's talking about the people of God. And so just a little bit of clarity. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Genesis chapter 35. And I feel like I'm a broken record at this point and apologizing in advance for my dyslexia, but anytime we read anything in the Old Testament, my vocal cords and I have a battle. So bear with me through some of these. Um, but it says this, uh, starting at verse one. And God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to the God who appeared to you where you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings that that were in their ears and Jacob hid them underneath the terraced tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them and so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Cana, and he and all the people who were with him, and there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him. And when he fled from his brother and Deborah, Rachel's nurse, died, and she was buried under the oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alan Baturs. Bet- sure. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Pera Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give you the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in that place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and, and poured oil on it. And so Jacob called the name of the place where he where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel when they came still from distance from Ephraim. Rachel went into labor and she had a hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. And so her soul, when her, and as her soul was departing for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and she was buried and on the way to Ethereth, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar over her tomb and in the pillar of Rachel's tomb where it is there to this day. <clears throat> Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. While Israel lived in the land, Reuben went in and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Leah, Judah, Levi, Judah, is Issachar, Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Pataram. 
And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mirmer, or Kiriath Arbor, that is Hebron, where Abram and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and he gathered to his people old, full of days, and his son Esau and Jacob buried him. When I was in the sixth grade, I vividly remember sitting in a youth group service on a stack of chairs in the back of the room because I thought I was too cool for school. I don't think any of you have ever had to been in that position before. Okay, I guess just me. Um, But I was sitting in that space just listening to the message and I don't remember exactly what the pastor was sharing, but I do remember in that moment having this overwhelming impression in my heart that God was saying at one day I was going to be in full-time vocational ministry. I was gonna be a pastor. I remember going home that evening and telling my parents, hey, like I had this thing and my parents celebrated with me, but I think there was probably some little bit of, sure, he's a sixth grader. Tomorrow he might be an astronaut, who knows? But nevertheless, I shared that with them. Over the next couple of weeks and months, I had some life events that took place that caused me to first question God and then disbelieve in him all completely. And from that point, from sixth grade to the end of my freshman year of college, I learned to navigate two worlds. The one where I would pretend because my parents would call me or have me attend church and the one that I was living outside of it. Now, as a quick aside, I just wanna say for any parent in this room whose child is struggling with this concept of faith, don't give up on them but rather continue to pour into them and keep them in a place and making sure that Christ is the number one thing in their life. As a student, I hated it. I was so angry with my parents that they would force that to be more important than sports or school or anything. I had to go. But as an adult, I am beyond grateful that my parents chose to parent me in those moments instead of just be my friend in those moments. Because the seeds that were being spoken were being planted and someday, eventually, they got to be watered. And so I was walking through this journey, um, going back and forth, and in that journey, I made a lot of mistakes and hurt a lot of people, and eventually, as I was going to college, I started pursuing a law degree. Nowhere in my mind did I ever think about God in this process or that God would want anything of me. Well, in 2008, on Cesar Chavez Day, I was walking to my fraternity house and I was stopped in my tracks. And I heard an audible voice say, Ricky, you're done here. Now at the time, I had no idea what that was. I thought you know, someone was playing a joke on me or maybe I had some after effects from the, what I'd done the night before. But I didn't realize what was happening. And over the next couple of days and weeks, God started to have people in my life to start to remind me of him bring me back to his word, to call me to change my life, and in the end, call me back to the place that he called me many years before that. And he encouraged me to go back into ministry. I remember in that time thinking to myself, there's no way God would allow someone like me to do something like that. Last week, um, if you were with us, Pastor Michael had shared, his last point was that no person or no place is too far from redemption. And for those of us who have ever been victimized or experienced hurt or neglect, we are grateful for that truth, that God is not too far from us in our pain and our hurt and our abandonment and our struggle, but the same reality is true for those who have been a part of the hurting. God's mercy and his grace is not extended to some, but to all. And that's what God is doing here. To Jacob in verse, in verse one. What, what God is saying here, when he calls him to it, he's saying, Jacob, come back to the place where I've called you to. Now, because we don't recognize this and when we read things, we don't know that there's time, most scholars believe that this is somewhere between 10 and 20 years of time since God had originally told him to get to Bethel. And in that process, we shouldn't be like, if you've been walking with us rather, you shouldn't be surprised that Jacob has not been faithful to do anything. Because his story is marked with half-truths, lies, 
saying he's gonna go one place and not the other. So it shouldn't be a surprise that he hasn't got there. But you'd think, especially after the events that took place in chapter 34, which is some of the most gruesome and horrific things in scripture about you know, rape and genocide, that God would have said enough is enough. We're done. But God extends his mercy to him. But what Jacob does is key because God will continue to extend his mercy to us, but eventually the judgment will come if we don't say, if we don't repent. And what we can learn from this is that finishing well is not living a perfect life, but it's finishing a repentant one. Finishing well is a life marked by the humbleness to say, I have made mistakes and I need help and I need to change my ways. And that's what Jacob does. If you saw, in the, if you heard in the text at the beginning, it says that Jacob goes to the people he's over, he's in charge, and says, give to me your idols and your earrings, and then we are going to a place called Shechem. Well, Shechem should be pretty loud if you were here with us last week, because that's where all those events take place. Where all that pain and was come. And so what Jacob was doing was going back to the place and acting in a, in a ritual of repentance by taking the things that were taken from there and burying them back there. It was his act of repentance that was being formed in that moment. He was going back to the place and saying, I made a mistake, I messed up, I fall short. Now, I think for many of us, when we uh, hear the term idol, we have a hard time understanding what that means because none of us have like little Buddhas, right? Like sitting up in our house, <laughs> right? None of us do that. Or maybe you do, I don't, know. I don't. But we have to remember that what idols in this day and a represent things. In many ways, like people keep kept them in them as safe keepsakes or like good luck charms. And so just because we don't deify things anymore, like give them God titles, doesn't mean that those aren't represented in our life. What those things would have represented would have been fertility, finances, safe travel, entertainment. And I don't know about you guys, but I've got some of those in my life. I have allowed those things in my life to say, God, I worship you, but man, I really want safety. So I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that on that trip, I'm doing everything possible to make myself safe instead of praying to you saying, Lord, how can you make me safe? I become in charge just because I'm starting to worship this idol. And so what, what Jacob is doing here is he's going back and taking the things that would have probably were taken from Shechem, but many all, scholars believe also that he is finally doing what he was supposed to do several chapters before this when his wife Rachel had taken the household gods from her father's house and hid them. Jacob should have easily gotten rid of them, but instead, for the last 15-ish years, he's allowed them to be in his home. And so he takes all those things and he buries them. And he repents. Now, repentance is a military term, which means that I started walking one way, living a lifestyle, having allegiance to one thing, but then I say no more and I repent and completely turn my back to it and start walking a new way. And I completely get rid of it and, and, and forego this. And so what Jacob was doing finally was saying what he told God he would have done years before this, that you will be my one and only God. I think there are some of us in this room this morning that need to really do some heart work and to look inward and say, do I believe in God is one and only or is he the God of some or God of many? that have these other things represented in my life that I am pursuing just as much or even more than God alone because he is meant to be the one and only God. And so when we repent, it's turning from that and starting to go to the place where God called us to. Now there's two things that take place that when we live a life of repentance that is so beautifully represented in this text. The first it says is that there is an unseen protection or covering for those who are living a repentant life. It says as, as they were journey, journeying from Shechem to Bethel, that God put a fear upon those communities around him so that they would not attack him and his family on this journey to where they were supposed to get. 
What God was doing was protecting them even though Jabin did not see it. So often we see in scripture where it tells us something that God was doing that the characters in the story have no idea. But what God was doing was covering them in the process. 10 years ago, my wife was I think six months pregnant with our oldest daughter, Charlie. And in this time, I was approached by a church. Uh, we, were being, we were ministering in Oklahoma and another church from a, in Oklahoma reached out and said, hey, would you be interested in fulfilling one of our roles? And so I started going through the interview process and spending time with them. And, and this started turning into a, a season. It was like four or five months. And you're like, hey, it's between you and another guy. And so my wife and I decided, you know what? It's probably best that we go attend this, the church to see if this is where God is leading us. So we get in our car one Sunday and drive an hour away to get to the service and we get into the service and we experience it and we get in the car back and it was one of the most awkward silences I've had driving home. I eventually said to my wife, so what did you think? And she responded with, I don't know. And I asked her, are you, being, are you saying I don't know because you genuinely have no idea? Are you saying I don't know because you have an idea but you're afraid of what that idea is and it might make me feel bad? She's like, it's the second one. And I was like, so are you, do you think that God is saying this isn't for us? She's like, yeah. I was like, that's what I think too. And I remember being so angry with God. So many times I would be yelling at him, why would you make me go through all of this and present this thing in front of me and it make it seem like it was exactly where I was supposed to be just to have that door slammed in my face? What was harder was God was not only telling me to say no to it, but he's saying you had to pull your name out because they will choose you. So I had to make a phone call I never wanted to make. Well, Charlie has been about somewhere between two and six months years of age at this point. And I get a phone call from a good friend of mine who lived in that community. He's like, hey man, do you remember when you called me about that church when you were doing that interview process and asked me if I knew anything about it? I was like, yeah, vividly. I'm still a little upset by it. He said, they just fired everyone on staff today. And I remember in that moment, the still small voice of God saying, that is why I said no. What God was doing there for me in a moment was covering my family from something I did not know was possible because my young family didn't need to go through that trial at that point in my life. And so what God was doing was protecting me. His no was not his denial. His no was his covering from something I did not see was going to, that was going to come. And in that moment, God blessed me with the opportunity to see something that he was doing in the past, but many of us don't get that blessing. And I just want you to know here that if you've said yes to Jesus and that you've repented and you're choosing to walk this path and go towards a place that God is calling you, his word declares time and time and time again that he will cover you and fight your battles that you don't have to worry about what is happening around you because he is for you and not against you. And that's what he does for Jacob. As he's going on this journey, he is ultimately protecting him so he can get to the place where he was supposed to be. And that when we finish well and we walk in a heart of repentance, God is covering us in ways we didn't know. The second thing that we see when we live in a, in a heart of repentance is that God gives us his identity instead of the one the world has placed upon us. God gives him a new identity. We are told that when Jacob gets to El Bethel, which actually means the house of God, that as he's worshiping there, that God appears to him and says, you are no longer Jacob, but you are now Israel. Now, for many of us, we don't understand the magnitude of a name because to us, names are titles, not character. But in scripture, when someone gives a name, you are speaking a character over them. You're speaking their identity over them. Now, the name Jacob means heel grabber. Now, 
that name would had two meanings. The first one was to, to be clinging so tightly to someone that you couldn't see the difference, which could be a good thing. The other, vari- uh, what that name could possibly mean was deception, to, to trick people, to grab them by their heels and, and to kind of like uh, mess with them through that regard. And Jacob, if you've walked through this story, he starts to live in the second. He's the deceiver. And he starts to manipulate situation time and time again. So I want you to imagine for a moment, what if you every day heard someone say to you, you're a deceiver. You're a deceiver. You're a deceiver. You are a deceiver. The impact that that's going to have on the way you live your life. You've always been marked that way. So you always will be that. And then God comes and gives him a new name, Israel, which means to wrestle with God. Now this is an amazing blessing because this name is outlandish. That day and age, no one could have conversations with God. So to say that you are known not just to have a conversation with him, but to actually wrestle with him was beyond anyone's comprehension. God was giving him a a beautiful title, a beautiful new name, that he was not what the world had once defined him, but rather what God would define him. So each and every one of us, when we are born, we were given a name. Stay. Nope, maybe here, stay. Right, you've been given a name, this is mine, Ricky. And as, as we start going through life, we start to build up things and, and our name starts to have other things attached to it, successes and things. But in the t- process of time, we get some new names placed upon us. Maybe like not secure. Maybe something's happened and this becomes a mark that you've placed on yourself or the world has or unsuccessful. Or unsafe. or unloved, or no purpose, or inadequate, or unwanted. And through the reality of life, as you start to go through it, one of these names starts to cover yours. And you start living this life with this name on top of you that these hardships has started to define you. And now every time you walk into a situation, you go, hi, my name is Ricky, and I really don't feel like I'm wanted. And there are some times when I'm good at hiding this reality of me, but for the most part, once the heat starts to come and the light starts to shine on me, I eventually get too hot and this name starts to come out because I was marked by this by some point in my life. And what God says that when we are in his will, in his house, El Bethel, that the first thing that he does, one of the main things that he does to us, he says, I want this thing that's on you. I want this thing that has been attached to you, this thing that the world has placed upon you and says that you are that because that's not who you are, but rather what has happened to you. And for me, he says, Ricky, you're not unwanted. You're wanted, you're loved. I care. For some of you, it's one of these other names. And God looks upon you and says, that is not the name that defines you. I will define you. I heard a pastor recently say this. I wish it was my idea because it was so good. Was that resumes tell you where you've been. They don't tell you where you're going. God changed him because he's saying, you are no longer marked by this, but you're going somewhere else, which is the second thing that we need to learn about finishing well. Finishing well is not allowing our challenges to define us. It's not allowing our challenges to define us. So many of us uh, uh, walk through life and, uh, and experience hardship and assume that's who I am for the rest of eternity, but finishing well is not the absence of challenge, but it's choosing not to allow those challenges to mark you forever. There's this, dis- there's this belief in our world that coming to the end of something should be about coasting. That's just not the reality. 
we all know that there's hardships that come alongside of it. It's just, how, what do I do with it? As he's journeying this process, three events took place in Israel's life. First, his concubine died. Now, a concubine was a half-wife. The reason why someone had this was because their wife couldn't have children. It's a mess. But anyway, his, someone that he was intimate with, that he had children with, has passed away. That's hard. His favorite wife, Rachel, who he spent 14 years working for, passes away. And then his oldest son, Reuben, sleeps with his Stepmom, I guess, but his other concubine. Any one of those things would be overwhelming. All of those three things would be just devastating. Now, just for, for clarity purposes, because we all want to know what's happening there. In that culture, uh, there was a leader of every tribe. Their patriarch society, Jacob was the leader. If Jacob has not identified the next leader, they would then try to make themselves identifiable. And Reuben his act was a political move to tell his father and the rest of his siblings, I'm in charge. Dad can't stop me from doing this. I'm the man. So this is a, all kind of a mess. And, most, and, and as we've heard this and we've seen those three things, we should have an expectation that Jacob would allow those things to define him because that's what he's done throughout the rest of the text. All the other chapters are revealing that. But here instead, we see that when Rachel, who was allowing her suffering, not just to define her, but the next generation, because she was about to name her son Ben-Oni, which is the son of my sorrow, which means that that child, every single day for all of his life would have heard, you are the person of sorrow. You are sorrowful. You bring sorrow upon this world. This is the way that she was defining her son, her future. Jacob steps in and says, no, your name is Benjamin, which means to be my right-hand man, someone who's a trustworthy, who's stable, who's supportive, who is strong. For the very first time in his life, Jacob didn't allow his past to define his future. Man, there's so many of us in this room that have allowed our past not just to impact us, but to impact the generations after us. And one of the things that we should be striving after as individuals is to say, no, it ends with me. Those things that have been in my family, infidelity, cheating, whatever you wanna do, like not being you know, wise with money, those things that have been marked by my family, it ends with me. You can end it and not allow the things of the past to impact your future. And so I don't know what areas in your life that you need to look upon God and say, help me. But when you come to him, he will. The last thing that we see is finishing well is seeking, it seeks restoration. At the end of the story, we told that Jacob goes to his father, Isaac, and they reconnect. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, cool, well, no big deal. That's because we've forgotten the history. It's been 30 years since Jacob and his father has talked. The last time he spent time with his father, he uh, lied to him, he manipulated him, he cheated him, and then abandoned him. All of those things took place, and it's been 30 years. Could you imagine that conversation? When he finally gets back to the place where he's supposed to be, he sees his dad, Hi, <laughs> like how do you start? Like it, it's confusing and ruined and just like what, what takes place? And I think many of us look at this and be like, gosh, I wish the Bible gave us all this lengthy detail of how that conversation went. And I think the reason it doesn't is because we would turn that into a formula. We love formulas, right? And we'd, we'd have people say, oh, have you done the Genesis 35 way? Have you been like Jacob and gone to your father and done these steps? But the reason the Bible doesn't put those there is because each person, the way that you bring restoration with one another is different. Because what is important for one person is not as important for the other. And it's about actually having the ability to be humble and talk with and commune and try to figure out how to work through this painful past. And so finishing well is seeking restoration. Now I say seek, not gain, because it's a two-way street. 
and you have no control over the people behind, uh, their people's responses, but you have every tr- control of how you do, how you live it and how you engage in it and how you choose to walk in it. That is your choice. And to finish well, we're called to seek it. Now, if you're listening to any of this and you're probably thinking to yourself, that's impossible. Each and every one of those things is a task that seems way too daunting. You're right. It is impossible for you to do it on your own. The only way that this is possible is if you have a loving and vital relationship with Jesus. Because you have, you and me have no desire to admit fault. We love blaming fault on everyone else to admit it. Mm -mm. We can try our hardest to try to take these things off of us, but it just comes back. We can try our hardest to not allow the past to define our future, but if we are doing it on our own accord and not in partnership with Christ, we can't. And so I would encourage you today that if you don't know Jesus, that today would be the day. Because it's only through that that you can finish well and do these things. And finishing well is so important because it is the fruitfulness that is not just given into you, but to the, all of those around you. And so I'm gonna invite the, the van, band up to, to close with us this morning and just ask you this. If you're in this room and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as we sing this last song, would you do it? Would you, in, a, in this time, maybe just have a conversation on your own, just saying, God, I don't know if you're real or if this thing is true or not, but if you are, help me in this process. Help me to start to, to have a new name. Help me to walk through this journey because you are the one who gives me strength. For other of us in this room, maybe you've been on this journey, but you, like Jacob, haven't gotten to the place where God has wanted you to. And you've stopped short and you've lied and you've manipulated and you've prevented yourself from doing that. Would you come to say, Lord, will you forgive me? I've been trying to take these names off me. I've been trying to do these things on my own, but I need you. Because it's only you who can do it. And so as we conclude today, we're gonna be singing this song called The Spirit of the Living God. And I would just ask that as you sing the songs that you read the words because it's only by God and God's spirit alone are you able to finish well. Would you stand with us, church?
Where is life not more than this? 